Ladies and gentlemen, we will now be moving on to the next item on the agenda, the first panel session for our event today. I will now hand over the session to our esteemed moderator for today, Ms. Karen Lam, coach and former Channel News Asia host. Over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Naveena. Just want to make sure that we're all okay. Can you hear me loud and clear? Leah, I see you on the screen. Yeah. Okay, superb. So welcome one and all to the kickoff panel discussion for RHB inaugural ESG forum, the first of the first. In the next hour or so, we're going to be training our eyes on specifically the Malaysian landscape and hopefully find some answers if it is possible at all to move that ESG needle in the positive direction. Um, we're going to be in for a quite a loaded session in light of the number of Malaysian companies that have been in the news lately for, shall I say, not exactly the most positive reasons. We've got Top Glove, the world's largest um, glove manufacturer who's had their goods seized by the US Customs and Border Protection Unit on complaints of labor issues. We've got two Malaysian plantation giants, Saim Darby, FGV, held up also by the same entity in I think uh, there's a bit of an internet connection issue here. Please uh, give Karen a few minutes to uh, rejoin us. I'm sorry, I seem to be have uh, seem to have been cut off. Uh, we're good. Okay, super. So yes, sorry about that. I'm not quite sure where I got cut off, but uh, let's just say that we are in for a very exciting session. Uh, could be controversial to some extent, but uh, our intrepid experts are going to be leaning in on some of these issues, and they certainly have their work cut out for them. We have. May I introduce to you the advisor and council member of the Institutional Investors Council for Malaysia, Leah Rahman. And we also have the executive director of the governance and sustainability team of risk consulting practice of KPMG, and that's Ms. Pang Oi Ching. Welcome, ladies. Hello, Karen. Hello, everybody. Good morning. You certainly can't be more excited to talk about these issues, can you? Uh, <laughs> we are ready. <laughs> so let's set the background, shall we, for, for the sake of our audience. Um, uh, Dato Kairul Saleh had already uh, articulated and given us some numbers on the ESG landscape in terms of the assets and the management. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, an instance for, according to Morningstar, assets under management of ESG funds saw an increase of 29% in 2020. So there is a general momentum, a positive momentum uh, towards this uh, uh, interest and, and definitely money's going into the talk here. Uh, what's the situation like here in Malaysia specifically? Because those are global figures. Maybe Oi Cheng, you can start the ball rolling for us. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Sorry, what, Karen. That's all right. What do you think? Tell us what it's like specifically here in Malaysia, because those figures are global. Mm -hmm. What's the situation here to your with, with regards to uh, sustainable investing yes. and the momentum and the growth, uh, yes. I think Malaysian companies are increasingly, or rather the investment uh, uh, sector is, is increasingly uh, being aware and investing and uh, setting aside funds for, for ethical funds or what we call socially responsible investments or SRI funds. And uh, we I don't have a good grasp about what the actual number is at the present moment. I, um, it's been something that we've been trying to get, a, get, get an understanding, but, you know, based on what I see over the last year or so with the, with the amount of 
uh, increase of, of um, banks getting involved in, in conferences, banks and, and investment community discussing with regards to um, what is ethical investing, what is sustainable sustainable investing, how do we get into it? I, I would say that it is picking up and it's picking up very quickly here in Malaysia. Hmm. So that's good news. Yeah, key principally, I mean, the key drivers has been uh, the EPF and Quap being the first two key movers. Uh, but they're not quite it, it, as per the financial institution investing, you know, the, these are pension funds investing. And also it, they, they have been really good in, 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 in raising awareness and, and raising, uh, 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 how do you say, the profile with regards to socially responsible investments, as well as what the SC and Bursa has done as well. Yeah. Certainly moving in the right direction. Yep. Leah, you would be in touch with institutional investors, and we've talked about how the pandemic has raised awareness, particularly uh, uh, of, of ESG issues and standards. What's your experience there, specific to Malaysian corporates and the pandemic? Yeah, I, I think uh, ESG investing, like O Cheng said, and earlier even Dr. Omar, as well as uh, uh, Cairo Saleh, right, mentioned just now, that I think yes, ESG investing has become more and more important. And we all know that, you know, uh, with the pan COVID pandemic now we are facing, ESG uh, now is a call for action and not just mere compliance. Uh, and we can see that the ESG ESG agenda is here to stay with more and more investors showing strong, strong conviction on ESG criteria in their investment decision making. And like what Dr. Omar said earlier, it has proven that the companies that have uh, good uh, ESG policies and practices with a uh, 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 well-structured uh, risk consideration embedded into these activities, they will definitely perform well and we'll be able to face the challenges under the COVID uh, pandemic better than other companies. But my concern has always been that I mentioned earlier that ESG be seen as just mere compliance, especially in terms of reporting. You know that Bursa have done a lot to make sure that the company disclosed very well in detail their ESG activities. But the actual fact is that there's something that we need to ask us ourselves. Did really this company do what they disclosed? I think I'm always concerned about that. Like, in other words, form over substance, because again and again, we face evidence, we heard news that company has something which actually against what they have disclosed in their reports. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my concern, yeah? I think I better stop there, Karen, <laughs> not on and on. <laughs> and you're already jumping in with your concerns. All right, so we yeah. are hot on your heels then. But, but can I just uh, take a backtrack slightly, a little bit more, just to, to, to have some, some foundation to, to our discussion. Maybe Oi Ching, uh, in, in your view, since you do have a more international perspective of, of, of the situation around the world, um, what are the circumstances in Malaysia that are unique to this country that make it uh, conducive for ESG investing? Uh, okay, to talk about ESG investing, the uh, the key drivers has been, in particular, what uh, Bank Negara, Bursa and the SC has been doing, informing the JC3 committee, and informing the JC3 committee, actually the prime mover, if I were to move back a, a step, was that Bank Negara joined the uh, the uh, Green Central Bank, so the, the network of Green Central Bank, and based on that, the adoption of uh, uh, how do you say, greening our financial institutions, looking at climate risk and all of that had, had been a, a key driver in, 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 uh, in moving Bank Negara, uh, SC and, and, uh, and Bursa into uh, looking at how they could encourage financial institutions to look at, um, to look at their, um, their risks with regards to exposures to, to climate change, let's say, for example, and ESG risks. Uh, for 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 um, on a broader picture, so that that has been really good. But even before then, the SC had already looked at you know developed guidelines and guidance documents with with setting up the the trying to set up the right environment to encourage socially responsible investments. And so it's it's been there, it's been chugging along, but it didn't. It took the I would say the 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 whole thing, the whole 
issue of the pandemic and then the, the JC3 coming on board with, with uh, financial institutions needing to identify their climate risk in their portfolios, in their activities, and, and to, to, to actually, uh, I would say, for a push, uh, provide greater momentum to financial institutions and to create a, uh, a uh, so-called better environment, I would say. Right. Uh, with regards to what uh, Leah said earlier, in, in terms of, and also um, uh, Datuk said earlier, with regards to uh, the reporting and the state of reporting in, in Malaysia, as you know, KPMG uh, does a, a two yearly uh, study with regards to the state of, of reporting. And although, as, as to support what, what, what has been stated, although we have got a very good level of compliance, the standard of reporting actually needs a lot to be improved. And so, you know, it, it, um, I'm sure Leah will have something to add on this. It, it comes back to, to the, you know, the government might provide all the right, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, situations for corporations and for financial institutions and for organizations to progress and to take advantage, you know, on social bonds, green bonds, sustainability, link loans, social, socially responsible investment. But if you don't recognize and you don't understand the power and the, the use of, of ESG reporting and ESG framework, then it, it, it's self-defeating in itself, you know, you know, whatever that, that, that uh, EPF and, and Quap will do, whatever banks will do, um, if, if companies don't understand, I'm very glad to see the number of participants that we have here today. If banks don't understand and financial, sorry, not financial institutions, uh, companies don't understand basically the clients, RHB clients and all don't understand what, what, what the requirements and how to structure and position themselves um, to the best uh, of, of their ability with regards to ESG factors and ESG reporting. Then it's self-defeating, you know, you've got all these good conditions that's created, but market is not responding. So it, 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 in essence, it takes two hands to clap. Karen? Yeah, yeah. But, but I think, sorry, Karen. But yes. I think, uh, uh, you're talking about the quality of reporting. My, my concern is that, uh, especially in the larger company, you can see that they have fantastic, well-crafted uh, reports with their fantasy excellent policies you know but mm -hmm. can you hear i mean example like even a uh, karen mentioned what happened to talk love and our big plantation companies you know if you look at their disclosures they should not be facing those problems right but we know for the fact that they're having this yeah. problem we will talk further in, in details about that and also we talk about when some company they showed you know like cg report i'm talking about when you talk about esg i'm very passionate about the he a lot of people have been talking about environment a lot of people are talking about climate change but i think uh, to certain extent we have a bit a bit neglected on the issues of uh, social aspect, especially uh, under the current situation, the COVID-19 situation, where you see a lot of uh, uh, labor issues being accused, you know, uh, uh, towards the big companies, not small companies, big companies, mm -hmm. for that matter. And also governance, you see the latest development, you know, where even the conduct of auditors being questioned by companies. And of course, we look at even the role of the independent directors. Are they really independent in carrying out their duties, right? I mean, with all this, we can talk further. So my issue is not just uh, well-crafted or, or well-drafted, uh, uh, well-published report. So what do they really do in that company? Yeah. You know, because so if it's a small company, right? Yeah. Even a small so company, I, I've seen, sorry, Kara, just, just a short one. Even a small company, I saw some of the report, fantastic. But by looking at it, I already know that actually they do not have the practice. Yeah. yeah. So, great. You are jumping right in with both feet right now into all the things that we're going to be talking about <laughs> uh, on, in, in the micro, more micro perspective, which is uh, from the point of view, from the point of view of the operations of corporates. But allow me at this point, just for the benefit of our investors as well, to pull it up slightly. We will get there. We will, I promise you, we will, we will touch on the uh, more juicy stuff. But just to pull the discussion up a little bit more, let's just talk first about the environment of ESG investing in the first place. So we're seeing this big bugbear right now when it comes to data. Investors need data. Unfortunately, data is coming through on ESG uh, uh, funds and, and ESG uh, uh, compliance in 
very non-standard ways, very diverse. Every, ind every index has its own indicators. So, you know, how is an investor, I Ching, to look at um, the data in front of him or her when two sets of data can rate company XYZ both an A as well as an F? Oh, well, that, that, that difference generally will not occur, but you can get an A and a B plus, right? You can get an A and a B minus. Uh, and it, it, a lot of it depends on the indicators that are used by rating agencies. And these are the ones, you know, as 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 uh, as Dato has mentioned, uh, with regards to you know the the commercial ones. I I won't name them. We all know them, and some of us actually use them as well in 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 our, our evaluation of companies to determine whether is is uh, investment worthy or not. Would At like the same, us, would you like to tell us which ones you use in particular? Uh, we we don't use them uh, because we, we we primarily provide uh, advisory in terms of ESG and sustainability. So we help our clients, uh, whether it's financial institutions or whether it's corporates, to understand uh, what the what what the importance of this ESG rating indicate uh, indices and what they mean and how it could impact. I mean, uh, what Bursa what Bursa mentioned with regards to the the FTSE for good is one of them. Yeah. Right. And, and so you can see the, the, the vari variability in difference in approach, right? Uh, companies, some companies have got 40 indicators. Some companies have got 20 indicators. So how do you compare apples with apples? And that's always been the problem. And that is the problem now uh, where it comes to financial institutions trying to look at how you want to uh, tailor, sustain a socially responsible investment. So one of the things uh, that, that is very, very true is is. Um, financial institutions who are looking at this and building up uh, socially responsible SRI funds and all of that and managing SRI funds. Is, the question then is always, do you want to develop your own or do we use third party? But if we use third party, how is it aligned with our goals and how is it aligned with our, our investment objectives? Right, and and that's very important. It's not just willy really nearly just pull uh, the the uh, GR uh, sorry the the ESG indicators that that you have that you can buy, and then let's look at whether we're gonna invest this or not. Because you've got all the way from from the really big and well established indicator uh, uh, indices, uh, evaluators, and right down to the smaller, more boutique ones, such as you know ones focusing on climate change. So, uh, it, it, you know, they're, they're, in terms of uh, climate change investing, I'm sorry, I agree totally with what Leah says with regards to governance and, 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 and um, the social part. But, you know, in terms of maturity, the most mature is, is the E part. And with especially with the climate change part, so there is there, it, over the last few years, you've seen a growth of, of climate only specific investors, right? And, and that has, uh, that has, uh, uh, you know, created a very niche investing market. So, you know, the, the, then for, for Malaysians, as we move and as we expand towards this, we have to ask ourselves, what is our investing uh, uh, objective? What do we want to, to, to gain from this? Uh, do you want a, a climate index, an index only or climate in investment only in uh, uh, in, in uh, an investment portfolio or do we want to grade, put it broader? Then you have to look for the indicator, uh, the, the index or, or the index that, that not index, the, the evaluator that actually uh, gives you and covers the, the areas mm -hmm. that, that you want. But yeah. then again, it also comes back to trustworthiness as well. Yeah. Trustworthiness of? Of, of the, of, you know, how well do you trust the, the, the evaluator, the, the, the index, the index that you're looking at. You know. So, do you trust the FTSE for good versus Malaysia index? Oh, I think FTSE, uh, FTSE uh, has done quite a lot of work from the time that it's evolved from the beginning uh, in in uh, pushing the market and, and pushing uh, uh, reporters uh, towards improving the ESG investment. It, it as as we all think as, as we everything you know ESG investing GRI reporting sustainability ESG is always a journey you can't get it right the first time our, my experiences and our experiences generally it takes a company several years up from you know anywhere from three to five years to actually get to grips with, with what it, it needs to what is important to it or what is material to it for, mm -hmm. so that they can actually institute changes and institute monitors and measures so that they can actually start reporting in the right thing. Now, a lot of companies don't realize the report is just an end product. 
It's not a checkbox or tick box exercise to follow. Oh, personal EES requirement, GRI requirement. I reported this, this, this. It's all in my report. It has to be followed up with, you know, to get that report, you have to do real hard work at what you are doing within your operations. And this is, this is, this is similar, you know, for, for banks, for, for whatever organization. So if you don't put in a hard work to set up your, your programs correctly, you can't report correctly. So it, it, it's, all circular in, in that sense. It's all tied up together. I'm sorry it took a bit long, Karen. So no, 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 no. I think it makes sense. Really, what you're saying is essentially not one size fits all. And uh, you've got to do the legwork yourself. There is no easy one-step solution. Mm. So, but but Le in Leah, in your experience, when we're talking about uh, you know, uh, um Oching had mentioned that uh, it takes time, three to four years, right? And we do know that the Bursa uh, Malaysia index, the Putsi for Good Bursa Malaysia index has been around for what, about seven years since 2014. And the number, as, as Dr. Omar has also pointed out, of, of uh, uh, constituents have, uh, what's that, more than doubled to 74, I believe it is, 74 companies who have committed to uh, that, uh, to, to the guidelines. So the question is, six years, that's a, seven years is a lot of time to get your act together. I'm sorry, Karen. It's ninety percent uh, reporters. We've got a, a, a reporting rate of ninety-seven percent mm. for the for the FUSI for good constituents. I think it's grown to about seven. That's what you're talking about in terms yeah, of constituents. Right. Yeah, they they don't get uh, they don't get a choice. FUSI evaluates their their report and then say, okay, you're ready. You've done this, and right. we, we you know we 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 give you a weighted uh, a rating points and then we rate you and then you you get on uh, or you are this close we you know you need to improve so it's, it's not quite a, 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 a voluntary system FTSE yeah. evaluates the individual companies but our reporting our reporting rate with regards to ESG reporting is is phenomenal we've got 97 percent you know it's it's great and and that all, already said, based on his, his studies, they've got about 93%. So it's mm. for Malaysia, we are doing great. Mm. When it comes to compliance or reporting. Mm. Sorry to interrupt. That, <laughs> that quantity. Mm. Yeah. What's your comment on the quality? Quality. I, I, I think quality, as you can see from the news that we read every day and what happened to even our large companies, I think we need to get the regulators, especially BUSA as a frontline regulators to, I think, effectively monitor that. You got the report and when you write the report based on their reporting, it looks good on paper, right? But I think it should be on physical uh, uh, monitoring that maybe you go down and, and you know, engage with them proactively you know to uh with the board of mem board members and see how involved they are in ensuring or in monitoring or, or overseeing the esg practices by the by the company rather than just leave it to the management and when they just report you just take a face value i think the board especially uh independent directors have to play a major role a proactive role in ensuring that the company is actually on the right path um, we talk about the data. My only concern is that too many data, too many tools, it get confused. And, and big uh, institutional investors, of course, they have their own uh, uh, dedicated team. They have their own tools and their own uh, 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 guidelines on how they measure the the the, the ESG uh, uh, for, uh, on their investing companies. But I'm also glad to note that Bursa is also looking into uh, standard, uh, to 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 come out with a standardized uh, uh, data and and uh, um, uh, guideline or, 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 or parameters that you know uh, uh, that people can easily use uniform uh, uh, tools that everyone can use you know and and we are we at i see like dr uh, omar mentioned just now we are working closely and collaborating with brusa on this to make sure that that's what investors want mm. see, there's no point having something that investors say oh i don't really need this so we, we really uh, commended Busa for coming to us so that we can work together. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, it's certainly good news to see that there is that kind of action behind all the talk. Yeah. Um, let's shift our attention now to something that you just couldn't help but get out of the bag early on in this discussion. Let's now move to the individual companies that have been in the news, but more importantly, you know, I, it, it's not about it's not about nitpicking, but we really want to learn from these 
uh, um, instances. So top of mind now, let's talk about Top Love, right? World's largest glove manufacturer. Uh, they had their goods withheld by the US, US Customs and Border Protection, uh, not once, but twice at least. We know the latest one was in March this year, and then in July last year, the goods were also held back on complaints of forced labor, what they call forced labor. Uh, well, to be fair to Top Love, they have responded to it by bringing in a third party assessor uh, to look at their operations and they've gotten the thum thumbs up. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is a PR fiasco. Uh, however, Top Love comes out of it because as the old adage goes, there is no smoke without fire. So there are two things that I want to focus on, two particular stakeholders I want to focus on and get your views on. Um, firstly, Top Love itself. How are they to move on from a situation like that? We know that 30% of their share price has been wiped out from pretty much from this debacle. How are they to move on? Yeah, Karen, uh, uh, to be fair, right, before we had, uh, I'm talking about ISC, before we had engagement with Top Glove, you know, we were very concerned because, uh, uh, you know, Top Glove, which we know have, uh, in terms of reporting, we can see that they high, uh, I mean, high CG practices, we good reporting on their sustainability, their ESG, and even the treatment to their employees and, and, and workers. And it, it, we got shocked when we saw that news. However, I think the way I look at it is also a communication uh, 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 problem, you know, between uh, uh, the company and the stakeholders and also investors. Because I think, uh, uh, the, I mean, they, they did engage with the investors, but, uh, you know, most times that we only volunteer, we only say something that what we want to hear. But we don't know what is actually the underlying problems until all these so uh, uh, workers' labor issues cross up and their products being banned by the uh, CBP, uh, you know. And, but to be fair to Top Globe, we pick up on Top Globe because they are on the top. Uh, uh, they are the top company in terms of their market cap now. But do not forget, we also have other manufacturing companies who actually also have maybe worse uh, labor issues problem than Top Glove. But we, we, we know about Top Glove because they're picking up with, uh, uh, by the CBP, they have been sanctioned, you know, and also the plantation companies. Look at plantation companies. And, but, and the worrying part is that now he's also has spread to the electronics, right? We know about all these labor issues. But my, my concern is that, why are we subjected to all this? Like you say, you know, if there's no wind, uh, you know, if there's no wind, the, 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 the tree would not uh, move, right? So there must be something or there's no fire, there will not be any smoke. There must be something that, which I think all these companies need to learn. Not, 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 not for us to pinpoint to say they're not good, but it's something that perhaps they have not done enough. And perhaps the board members have not done enough to ensure or to monitor and oversee the whole thing. You know, so I think it's a lot of perception that independent directors are not really independent, especially if you look at uh, uh, the, the, the uh, for you, you mentioned about Tagula, right? There's always like a, a negative perception that the independent directors are beholden to the major shareholders because it's a family control company. And you look at you look at their situation whereby their independent directors, if had two of them actually uh, are actually inherited from their parents. <laughs> you get I mean? Independence inherited the position of independent directors, they got it from their parents, which I think to certain uh, certain extent it, it, it really prejudice it makes a prejudice against their independence. Right, uh, because the nomination process is not really clear. Why are they chosen? You know, how many candidates were were, were, were considered at that point in time? We, we do not see all that. So I yeah. think it's the perception. But I think uh, uh, when we engage with Tabla, they mentioned that they have almost fulfilled uh, uh, whatever requirements. All right, the, but they have rectified a lot of problems. But unfortunately, only in July, I mean, it recently we heard again, they have been sanctioned. So they are actually expected for the sanction to be uplifted. But unfortunately, when we heard that another sanction on their, another product, you know, so it's a sad case. 
So I think it's a lesson learned by toddler. I think they should not take it too easily on their worker. It's not easy to manage the workers. And also, we also, it's a, it's a I would say it's reputation uh, risk here because uh, you look at a uh, toddler, they're even being charged by their, uh, or their, their home ministry, the home ministry, uh, no, not home ministry, by the human resource ministry for not having certified accommodation. Right, so I think in this aspect, we also maybe perhaps the government should also help this company rather than charge them and make their 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 image uh, uh, worse or or you know their reputation become good. Maybe they have more engagement because from what we know is that the certification is not that they have not done it because it is subject to phases where the Human Resource Ministry do not have sufficient manpower to complain on time. My question mm -hmm. is, I also asked the board, why then did the Human Resource charge you off? Right? If they have not done the job, why are they you know, picking on you? So there must be something, which I think we also consider maybe having engagement with the Human Resource uh, Ministry. Yeah. Like, yeah. So what was the response when you had asked them squarely that question? Why is the human resource? Yeah, it, 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 they said that it, 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 of course, toddler being nice, they did not blame the human resource. But I have concern because if, when they mentioned that they have submitted the applications, out of that only certain percentage have been certified because of uh, uh, lack of manpower by the human uh, resource ministry. So to me, is that why are they being victimized when the, the human resource can't even do the job, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, but, but of course, to be fair, we have to hear from both parties. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And also our concern when you look at a human uh, uh, issue, uh, I, mean, I mean, talking about labor issues surrounding uh, toddler, we also look at uh, uh, the, the issue on the whistleblower part. So that's also fundamental because the whistleblower is actually uh, 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 whistleblowing on the uh, uh, treatment of the workers. And we, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Leah. Sorry, sorry. We, we, we. Uh, I think with regards to the uh, let's just say labor issues and Malaysian companies. Um, okay. Yes, I agree that uh, that that you know with regards to board responsibility and understanding the requirements that that has the onus is on on the corporate itself on the company itself. But I think a lot of it also comes from the fact that uh, Malaysian companies do not understand the requirements of the customs and borders uh, 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 requirements on, on the use of forced labor, right? And so because we in Malaysia have our own set of laws and regulation that uh, essentially Malaysian companies need to comply with, and then the U.S. Uh, uh, borders and control come up with, you know, have their own set of, 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 of regulations which they uh, are impacting uh, their, their own customers and whatever that's imported into Malaysia. So there is a misunderstanding in, in, in the sense that Malaysia, we are dealing with our own labor, labor laws and labor requirements and the U.S. have got their own labor laws and labor requirements. So they, there is a mismatch with regards to understanding. There's also a mismatch also with, with regards to um, understanding how to meet and answer the, the borders and customs requirements, right? Uh, uh, without going into too much details, uh, it, it is not just a matter of, for, for a lot of corporations who has this issue, it's not just a matter of uh, engaging a third party to come in to do your audits. It's not just a matter of, of, of um, getting it independently verified, whatever programs that you have. It's a matter of also being able to communicate whatever that the findings there is from, from your third party, that you have done the corrective action, there is an action plan for improving, and that you, you are able to communicate this uh, more better to, to the uh, customs and borders. So I'm, I'm sure uh, companies like, like, like Top Love and, and um, whichever uh, organizations that have come in the news of late is, is an issue that, that they've been grappling with. Whether fairly or unfairly, uh, that's, this is not the forum to stay, to 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 discuss. But you know, in, in essence, we do have a, a lack uh, in our like regulations, in our laws in, in Malaysia that looks at how we manage migrant labor and how we 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 talk with regards to remuneration, pay the pay and and the and the management. So it, that um, lack of legislation or that lack of clarity with regards to where our government stands with in, in that regard uh, does not uh, provide support to Malaysian corporations to meeting international requirements. And this 
need it needs to be borne in mind, especially for investors. You know, if you're looking for for um, targets and that they are sustain that they are, they are social issues and most of them relate to 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 uh to labor issues, uh, employee issues. We have to remember around the world uh, that there is a proliferation of uh, modern slavery legislation. And this is essentially where it's all coming from. The, 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 the management of forced labor with regards to child labor, women, uh, 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 forced long hours, you know, remuneration and all of that. So that, that, that uh, where your clients are, where your customers are, where your business is, where you export to, you have to be very aware of what these requirements are because it, it's basically looking at suppliers and basically looking at, at, at the, the supply chain. So uh, we do need uh, a, a firm stance or, or clear, clearer stance from uh, the Malaysian government in, in yeah. this regard. Yeah, Osha, right. I agree with you. Hey, can, I, can I bring in a, a point here now? Uh, yeah. I'm just going to interrupt. And uh, <laughs> uh, I just want to just uh, just sort of put pull together what the, what the both of you have, have highlighted, at least what I'm hearing. Firstly, the, the issue here is communication. Both of you have mentioned the issue of communication, uh, whether it's communication uh, with, the, with the companies uh, and the investors, or whether it's communication with the uh, trade partners. And the other thing I'm also hearing, which is a good point, Oichin, that you brought up, was that, you know, is it really just about recalcitrant Malaysian companies, or is it really a case of bilateral trade issues, maybe more than just the human resource ministry, the, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, or even the Ministry of Foreign Affairs would have to step in here to, to intervene and, and have a look and, and, and what will kind of oil and uh, oil the, the, the passageway to, for, for Malaysian companies to trade overseas as well. I, 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 I do agree with that, that uh, we do need to, to put our heads up and see where the prevailing winds, especially with regards to labor issues, uh, globally and how it's actually impacting our 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 trade. Given the fact that we are a trading nation, we are also a manufacturing nation. So this this actually has severe implications. But like I said, you know, Malaysia has we have our own set of laws, right? We've got international laws, oh sorry, rather the, the laws of a country which is basically saying that you're not complying with what we require. Despite the fact, you know, if, if you if you look at what Pop Love is doing, they've provided all the evidence and said that, you know, we are doing this. And basically, all it needs, from what I understand, in, in, in the US is somebody to, to file a complaint or to file an issue with evidence in the US with the Customs State and, uh, and Border uh, for them to raise uh, an investigation. So yeah. it, it's it's... You know, we've got tons of, and we're particularly in, in, in this case, we are quite an open economy. We've got lots of NGOs that, that are working around in, in this area. So it, it's, it's a question of, we have to help ourselves. We have to understand as a country, government and, and corporate that, you know, this is where the, 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 the world is heading. It's just like whether you want to embrace uh, climate change or not, whether you like it or not, the world is telling you, you have to embrace climate change. So it's the same thing. The world is telling you, you have to start addressing your, your, your migrant labor issue. You have to start addressing and you have to start having proper regulations or proper guidance with how you want to treat them, how, how you want to, to, to uh, manage them. You know. So that, you. that is important. Yeah. I agree with you, Ochi, but, but to be fair, I think this company have taken a lot of measures, a lot of initiatives and effort to, to, to rectify the problems. You know, in the case of Top Glove, yeah, we, we, we saw it as a negative news for them, but they have even engaged independent international consultant to look at whatever they, they, whether they have complied and make sure they ratify those problems. So we, we, we but I think the most important, like I agree with both of you that we need the support from the government. Without the support of the government, I think it can also be quite difficult for them because mm -hmm. once you got the sanction to update, the sanction is not as simple as we are done it, tomorrow you are update. It's not going to be that way. So I think we need a lot of support from the, from the government, from the various ministries, yeah. So in many ways, when we look at what the, the, the entire debacle that Top Love has gone through, uh, in many ways, you know, the silver lining to it is the fact that there have been improvements, that, that these measures have pushed the company to, to be more stringent and uh, to, to, to do, I suppose, what we would call the right thing. So while we bemoan Top Love's uh, labor issues, the spotlight on Top Love 
didn't just stay on its labor issues and its social aspects. It also turned to governance issues. So we know that BlackRock, one of its uh, shareholders, recently in its AGM had opposed the re-election of the independent directors. And of course, that bid was, uh, de uh, was denied and the entire board was re-elected. So it's not just BlackRock that's making uh, a bit of noise about the role of independent directors. We have very prominent financial figures here in Malaysia also chiming in on this issue, in particular, the former uh, chairman of the SC, the Securities Commission, Zarina Anwar, last week also sounded out her concerns about accountability. So with all this moving, we would hope in the right direction, do you believe that we are going to see some positive change in the area of governance, particularly in independent directors, uh, or is it just going to be noise that's going to fizzle off and die a natural death? I think, Karen, on the uh, governance aspect, yes, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, the, 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 all this perception of how independent or independent directors, as you can see, like I mentioned, the perception uh, when it comes to uh, founder-based companies. So it's always that how are these independent directors sourced and how are they nominated? So uh, uh, I think what Blair has done is, is a good thing. And I, I, I hope that our institutional investors uh, uh, will start also bec uh, become more open in their voting. You know, especially if you look at, okay, another example that we, we car uh, the, the current example that very good for us to look at will be the, the issues surrounding cyber dynamic. The, the conduct of independent directors definitely have raised eyebrows, have raised concern whether they are really independent because to remove an auditor who is also a gatekeeper and, and the way they raise issue actually, uh, uh, they are actually blowing certain things that there are a lot of red flags and areas of concern and they are being uh, I mean, that, 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 there was an effort to remove them. You see, that itself is strong because it was initiated by a, a shareholder who is also non, non as independent, non executive director, who is also a member of AC. My question is that what happened to the chairman of the AC? Why is he keeping quiet? And do not forget that in Sabah Dynamic, they have more than 50 over percent independent directors. Five out of uh, uh, nine board members are independent directors. And now they have even appointed three additional independent directors. And one, of course, the chairman, the former chairman just resigned. That it makes what? Uh, seven independent directors and they have enlarged the board. You know, uh, for a mid-sized company to have such a big board, it's only a question mark. Why do you need that? Why you need the three independent new independent directors and the old the the, 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 the the current independent directors are still there? The question is that why you need new one? Is that because the current one not not competent enough to handle the case or not independent enough? But from the look at the issues. I think we we have concern on the state uh, uh, state of independence of the independent directors. Even at SC level, we tried twice, not once, twice to get engagement with the independent directors, and as to date, we have not received any mm. response from them. Why mm. are they so afraid to engage with the investors? Uh, investors, these are institutional investors. You should, yeah. you should be willing to engage with the investor. After all, we just want to, to clarify the issues. We only have questions. We do not have the answers. Yeah. You know? Because the audit issue raised by KPMG is not small issues. Right. Yeah, now, they have taken a baby step. I'll call it baby step because that's not really a solution to appoint EY to look at, uh, uh, as independent party, to look at those issues. Mm -hmm. But... You know, the, 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 the main issue is still there. It's very interesting. What would be the job scope they're going to ask this EY to do it? You cannot be appointing a, a big four, another big four audit firm to just verify the addresses, to just verify the spelling of the, co of the, the companies that, award, that, that was awarded the contract. It must be much more than that because the fees are not going to be cheap.
And by enlarging the board, it's also the fees to the company, the, the cost to the company. Why do you need to do that? Ideally, you should, if you're not competent enough, then they should be removed and get the new one. Or yeah. they should voluntarily resign. But we didn't see that happening except the chairman just resigned yesterday. But even that also is still a concern as far as I'm, uh, 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 as far as I'm concerned when I look at it. Why did he resign now? <laughs> you know? so you've yeah. got really good questions, Leah. You've got really good questions and you're, you're, you're asking the questions on behalf of the institutional investors. But well, my question is, mm -hmm. why aren't the regulators asking the questions? They're yeah. the ones on the team, right? Yeah, you see, that, that's why I said the regulator, I'm very sure uh, Brusa, even SC has questioned them, uh, has, uh, uh, you know, looked into the issues, but I think they should be more proactive, right? Mm. And, and whatever the, the, you see, the, the, the problem in Malaysia, I can see every time something happens, then the regulator will investigate, but we do not know what happened after that. There's no closure. As far as I'm concerned, a lot of investigation, we do not know what's happening. What is actually the findings? You know, look at the case of A Asia. I mentioned A Asia because we're talking about governance. They have set up independent uh, 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 party, another or, or the firm to look at that, and they say everything hunky dory, everything is okay. No, no, nothing wrong with that. But do not forget, we also have at that time a MCC investigator, SC. But what happened? Have they done? Have they concluded the investigation? Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. I've been asking myself, maybe I missed some reports or some news about their finding, but no. What I know that two of them have been reinstated, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but which actually is very obvious. So what we do not want is that selective enforcement, selective actions, it must be above board, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so mm, in all rather gloomy picture that you're painting, uh, I think, I think, uh, is there is there any optimism on your part in in this area of governance as we move forward? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I think, uh, notwithstanding the previous cases, I can't comment. <laughs> right, uh, but I think with regards to looking at doing the right thing and and um, encouraging corporations to do right, the right thing. I think the SC in itself has, has actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, been very uh, uh, forward in terms of developing guidelines on board duties, uh, the duties and responsibilities of the board with regards to financial duties, to look at ESG include. I mean, when you look at uh, board risk management and board responsibilities, not just look at looking at the PNL of the company, profit and loss of the company, but also to include non-financial risk as in ESG risk in, in this case. So it broadens the, the overview of the board. It broadens the responsibility of, of uh, senior management as well. It, and, and the latest move with regards to looking at KPIs, key performance indicators and tying the, the, the indicators with the remuneration of board and, and also senior management. I think it's, it's a, very, uh, a very good step. Uh, you know, if you look at, at leading leading uh, reporting nations, or um, uh, uh, in terms of board and uh, governance, corporate governance, uh, you know, looking at what Australia has done and what the UK has done, I think that's really really good because it forces uh, the tying the relationship between financial non financial risk management doing the, the uh, doing the right thing, tying it to rewards in terms of remuneration and 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 our bonuses and things. However, as we're always in Malaysia, it's always there, however, unfortunately. Um, you know, these things are treated as nice to have and, and not, um, not uh, uh, compulsory. And so uh, we, we tend to, to, to try and move uh, corporations and to move sectors, industry by uh, corporate Malaysia by doing the nice, uh, you know, gentle prodding along Maybe it's time that we think it's, it's time to put some of these things in as mandatory requirements. In fact, in fact, I just want to jump in on the, uh, because when you talk about the conduct of the independent directors, my concern is that the nomination process. And you can see that SC has uh, recently published the MCCG, the latest edition, where they emphasize more on the board dynamics and the nomination process. But I think most importantly, also Busa will need to look at what is the definition of the independence. 
you can see, right, yesterday at the, in, in the age, it was reported that even the three new directors appointed uh, uh, for Sabra Dynamic, they are, they are quite, they are collected and be seen as being appointed as a group. The question is that who actually nominate them, you know, and how robust are the nomination process? Because we have no doubt or no question about their, their qualification, their experience, but we want to know about how independent they are and can they be objective when they are quite connected with each other. It's not really independent. Yeah. So whatever decision, whatever come to their, 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 their whatever decision they come, they, 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 they conclude, it can be a group uh, a decision rather than independently they look at the issues. So that is the concern. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I think, you know, to, to, to carry on, I think there's a bugbear that's been around in Malaysia for, for some time. So, you know, bringing this up in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, unfortunately cases like this, and it also ties back to what's happening to, to corporate Malaysia, you know, with regards to how we treat our migrant workers, how we treat uh, climate change, how we have so, uh, corporate governance issues. Mm -hmm. I see them all as related because it's all a matter of understanding your role, your responsibility and, and, and making sure that you don't just look after the profit and loss of an organization, but you have to make sure that the non-financial risks are equally managed so as not to present a risk to you. Classic case as what we've been discussing is, is Stockwell. They have got good, you know, with regards to, to whatever that they report. I'm only going by what they report, Leah, right? In, in terms of uh, what's in, in the news, you know, they've been having record profits, yet at the same time, they're falling down because the, the, the lens over the, the non-financial risk aspect is not as serious as the lens over the profit and, 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 and loss side. And now you see non-financial risk seriously impacting on profit and loss. As you say, Karen, the, 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 their corporate value has, has decreased how many percent? 30. Yeah, that's significant. So, so well, uh, Probably about 15 billion ringgit, I believe. Yeah, which has been wiped off. So how do you maintain... At the end, I think at the end of the day, and, and also for a lot of uh, institutional and, and also private investors, looking at, at a socially responsible investment and, and all, how does a company maintain corporate value if it does not do so-called the right thing, right? The question and the definition of the right thing, now that, that is something that, that has been uh, 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 discussed and debated. And, you know, um, um, Bursa has brought it up in the sense that you know, they're looking at streamlining guidelines. It is understood that there's too many guidelines and there's too many uh, 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 rating, uh, uh, you know, KPIs that, that is out there. So what is the right thing? And that's really difficult. And I think you're going to have a session later to talk about the right thing, right? So <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's difficult. It's really difficult, you know. Yeah, but Oche, uh, uh, just to add to that, right? Investors, not especially the institutional investors, uh, although they want to have good dividend because they owe a duty to their beneficiaries, but they also look beyond the bottom line. You can see they look at the governance, they look at the social aspect as well as the environment aspect. You know, so the company should not take lightly, you know. They, they might, it's not like something nice to have, but you must have it now. Especially yeah. under this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it's a call for action now, not just mere compliance yeah. and reporting. I yeah. agree. I agree. It's time, it's time uh, the 800 public listed companies on Bursa, which are subjected to the Bursa uh, sustainability reporting requirements as part of their listing uh, 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 requirements, they, start, they need to start looking at uh, uh, the, the guidelines and the requirements as just not... Uh, you know, not nearly mere compliance. We have, you know, it's, it's coming back to bikers now because we are not take, we have not taken it seriously, and it shows uh, it in the way that we've been trying. You know, we've been we've been attracting investments. We've been uh, uh, building trust with with our customers and all. I mean, we that 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 is something that has to be understood from the board level right down to the late, the to lowest technician because it it's 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 something that. We cannot ignore anymore. Yeah, we, looking at, at Top Glove is the greatest example of <laughs> trying to do the right thing and yet it coming back to bite you. You know what I mean? And, you know, uh, Leah has said with regards to the electronic industry, the electronic industry actually have, have had 
social issues and labor issues being reported about them probably 10, 15 years ago. It's well known, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But they've done a great job in, in managing why. I, I, I think that's a question that needs to be asked, right? Yeah. So, uh, questions, yeah. speaking of questions, we're going to, at this point in time, we, uh, it is about time to wrap up. So, if you have our audience some last minute questions you want to chime in and, and get our panelists to respond to, do that or forever hold your peace. Uh, but in the meantime, what I want to do is to just get um, your perspective, your final perspectives on uh, two particular issues. I'm mindful that most of our audience are institutional investors. And right now here in Malaysia, while you both have indicated that, yes, EHG is picking up interest uh, and, and, and there is more talk about it, hence this forum, uh, it is still something that is lagging behind the global trends. Um, so on the part of asset managers, uh, there are very few, very few, probably a handful of asset managers who have uh, invested a dedicated uh, team looking into ESG investments. So my question on behalf of our institutional investors is, in your opinion, what indicators should they be looking at so, they, so that they can stay ahead of the curve and start looking seriously and more, more intently at ESG funds? Well, from my perspective, I think uh, investors and all, in, local investors and all have to start looking beyond compliance. Right. Uh, if, if I were to look at in, uh, where the invest, international global investors are actually putting their money in, I think we have to start looking at how companies are beginning to behave with regards to climate management. Mm-hmm. This is something that we cannot avoid. Um, uh, you know, we've, KPMG has just done a survey of, uh, of, of uh, reporting and 4% of companies, of top 200 companies in Malaysia only talk about climate change as a, as a material risk to them. And you know it 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 it's it goes in line with our our minister saying that climate Malaysia does not suffer from climate change, and so if you look at the floods and all that, I mean I won't go into the science of it, but it's a global phenomenon to say that Malaysia does not suffer from uh, climate change in its supply chain, in its operations, and in its businesses is, is I think being being myopic blinkered. The other one is looking at. We can't ignore this prevailing labor issue that we have, this perception of, of labor issue, if you want to talk about the S part, right? And, and um, I think that, that these are uh, serious indicators that, that um, the global community, investment community, and our customers is basically trying to tell us that this is, this is areas that we need to be concerned about. And as well as uh, the prevailing uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding of how it is being government, governance, sorry. So it's not a question of uh, good corporate governance looking in terms of um, uh, bribery, anti-bribery corruption. And, and, and also in, in a way, these are all compliance issues, but it's also looking at how do you have a framework within your organization to understand how you're managing your ESG risks and doing the, the, you know, the, the, the right thing. Uh, although I actually don't like the term, but doing 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 correct things to to drive yourself towards a better to 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 towards improvement. I mean, what is the right thing except what you define as your company? You know, within your company, compliance is not necessarily the right thing because compliance could be lagging behind what international. Uh, mm. You know, the world might have moved ahead ten paces, yet our laws haven't changed. So, so it, it, that's why I don't like the term the right thing. But we're not getting into the semantics. So, you know, you, you need to be able to demonstrate that. So, as I think, as as uh, socially responsible investments, or if you're looking at how you want to evaluate, these are the key things. Okay. Obviously, you still have to keep compliance there and all. But right. in, in terms of material issues, these are the things. Yeah. It boils down then to communication. Back to that well, again. It's not just communication. It's not just communication. Yeah, it's, it's not just communication. You actually have to understand the sector, the pressures of that sector, and why you need to apply this uh, evaluation for that sector. You know. Yeah. yeah. That's, not the board, that's what the board must be well equipped with the knowledge in order for them to challenge management rather than just uh, a take at face value wherever management told them at the board meeting. Right, and of course, they have to be objective and independent when they are challenging the management. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. That's very yeah. true. So, just a car late last week, uh, Piyush Gupta, the CEO of DBS, uh, Southeast Asia's largest bank, observed that there is what he calls a tsunami of money. 
uh, flowing in to the ESG asset class. So there is certainly a lot of interest, uh, if not an exponential amount of interest uh, and, and more importantly, money going into uh, ESG funds. We know and we have already established that Malaysia hasn't got that momentum just yet. And if I can go back to the theme of the conference, envisioning a better future, my last question to the both of you on your take on whether you can envision that better future for ESG uh, standards in Malaysia. If so, what will it look like? And more importantly, when will it happen? And I'm going to put you on a spot here, but I need your take on this. Um, I think if you look at uh, what the SC has been trying to do, you know, in, in stimulating uh, uh, socially responsible investments or basically sustainable, responsible investments, we, we uh, have already got the, the, the foundations, right? Um, like, like I said, uh, the momentum and, and the, the number of clients that we deal with that, that has all these client queries, that, that, is, that is something that uh, uh, Corporate Malaysia needs to, to sit up. So it is a question of two hands shaking in, in this case, right? You know, you can't just have the SC giving you all these things and Corporate Malaysia is going, so what? You know, basically some of them are, are saying that. But a lot of companies are, are sitting up and so what, what I think needs to be done, I, well, I see where I hope to see is, is that uh, responsible investment organizations in, in Malaysia get more organized, get together, come up with, come up with uh, 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 an organization. You know, in Australia, like I said previously, we, we have, oh, no, not in this forum, but uh, other forums, we have, there, there is the Responsible Investment Association of Australia, or uh, as we are, or uh, we are now, uh, R I double A. Uh, so it, it is it is something like that that actually gives um, uh, uh, how do you say focus and also gives a platform for for financial uh, uh, socially responsible investments in whichever way that they form in a platform mm -hmm. to engage with um, with their customers with their intended targets and also with government and so I, I hope to see a. a a tri-party uh, dialogue going on. And I think it, it, it is, it is uh, sorely needed. Yeah, back to you, you, Karen. If you look at the circumstances as they are, give me a time frame. When do you believe this will happen? Well, I think we need it now. It's just that we haven't got it that organized. Well, like uh, today, isn't it? Uh, well, I hope, I hope it comes up by, by next year. But uh, I, uh, given, you know, it... it, it, it we do have to get our act together and it's quite serious because there is so much funds floating around now, you know, out yeah. of out of out of Singapore, out of Hong Kong, out of Australia. And they're all crying for a place to invest in, but we haven't got our act together. I was just talking uh, last week to 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 a fund that, that has got uh, out of the UK looking to invest in ASEAN uh, with socially responsible uh, investments or even social impact investing and things. But I can't find one. Why? Because we, we are not reporting to the right indicators, we can't provide the, the right uh, the right forum, you know. So uh, yeah, so I hope to, to see this something a semblance of something coming up next year. Excellent, that's optimistic. And what about Leah? What about you? Do you envision a better future for ESG investments here in Malaysia? What will it look like, and when will it happen? Yeah, it's definitely there's a, there's a prospect and the future for this. And you can see that, you know, especially the biggest uh, uh, as owners, they are working very hard, you know, to, 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 to push for this uh, ESG agenda. And, and of course, they are closely monitoring their investing companies. Uh, that is at the investors level. But I would like to see, but I think the most important is that the institutional investor especially must play more proactive stewardship role in ensuring that so that you know the company behaves and therefore will be more uh, more attractive to the others to 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 invest in, in these companies you know mm -hmm. institutional investors now i think should be like what you say black rock you know daring to vote against certain uh, directors they're not doing their, their, their right job you know their, their, their job well so i think the institutional investors should also do that mm -hmm. i think the other thing they add on in, in pushing yeah. for this agenda yeah the other thing to add on is, is the fact that uh, 
in, within our investment community and financial institutions, there's a serious lack of cap capacity, capability, and there's a serious lack of understanding what is ESG and how it ties in with, with the financial institution operations. So this is something that needs to be corrected very quickly. I mean, even for, for us as practitioners and all, it, it, is, it is difficult to find the right people. More, what, what, you know, what more to say? Uh, something more specialized in the financial institution. So I think this, this is something that, um, that's why it's so important to have an institute in an organization like, 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 like uh, the uh, RIA, as RIA, uh, the, the Australian Responsible Investment Association, so that you can actually put all this platform together and say, you know, we need to do this, we need to do this, and let's start move forward, moving forward. And yeah. you know, th th there was a question earlier about asking about a national level. But the thing is, is that, you know, if you talk about at national levels, the moment you start pigeonholing in, in terms of uh, 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 these requirements at a national level, look at Bursa. Bursa is a national level socially uh, re sustainable reporting guidelines, right? It is applied across the country, whether you are in Sabah, Sarawak or whatever, as long as you have HQ and, and you are on the on the Bursa Stock Exchange, you are required to, reply, to report to that. So um, I think in, in that case, we already have that in, in, in terms of developing the KPIs and all. It just needs, it's not that we don't have the framework or, you know, in terms of reporting requirements, we don't have the framework not to say that we don't have the framework with regards to KPIs. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. It just needs to be regulated more. Yeah. But, but it's also uh, Institutional Investors Council, we are also looking into that. In fact, ESG is going to be our main focus this year, where we are also going to amend our code, uh, you know, to, so that we, 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 we can push the ESG agenda. But to be fair, you can see that even the asset owners, only the big ones are actually well equipped with this. And the other one at other smaller stake, uh, stake uh, I mean, uh, as an owner, they're still struggling, but they're, they're doing it. That, that's a journey. The journey can never end. You know, you, you know that, but we can see that everyone is putting efforts and initiative to, to, to at least, you know, uh, 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 accelerate their move towards uh, uh, achieving the goals. And that's such a positive way to end this discussion. The fact that the, <laughs> there is more to be done and things are being done. And I would want to appreciate you, Leah, for for being part of an organization that's that's pushing the agenda for ESG as well. So if we were to sum up this discussion, I think I can I, I see three particular threads coming through, uh, addressing three different stakeholders. Firstly, for the investor, that question about are there, are there national level metrics and, and are there standards and measurements that we can use? I think the answer and, and from the discussion we're hearing that you will just need to prioritize what exactly it is you want and you would need to have your own, uh, 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 you know, have conversations and essentially do your own homework and do the legwork because there is no one size fits all. There is not going to be one specific shortcut. So, you know, it takes time to uh, do good and to make money at the same time. The second part of it, if we were to look at the, from the, from the, perspective of corporates, what I'm seeing here is that for all the noise and all the uh, um, news that has been uh, generated from uh, negative news, shall we say, from, from this situation, we are seeing something positive come out of it. We are seeing improvements. We are seeing labor issues being addressed. Uh, you know, Top Glove, for instance, has, uh, we know that, that they have, uh, from this debacle, taken on recruitment fees whereas in the past they didn't do that for their foreign workers. So that's a positive move. And I think at the end of the day, when we look at the share prices, we're seeing what's happening at Cerber Dynamic with a 60% wipeout of their share value. We're seeing that off the top, off the top block with 30%. So shareholders, investors are talking with their feet. And I think that's something that is worth pursuing and worth moving on towards. And that's a good thing as well. And finally, uh, what I'm hearing is that third stakeholder, which is the regulators. Lots of talk about that. Is there enough teeth in the regulations? Are we just greenwashing? Is it just a good to, good to look at? And again, you know, I want to commend Dato Omar, who, who did recognize that there are still challenges and that there are still gaps. We're not going to get there overnight, but there is a recognition and if you're not, it's the courage, hopefully, to be able to stare these gaps blankly in the face and hopefully to address them as well. 
So we're seeing really um, the other thing that we talked about was trade issues, right? So we're not just looking at what's happening in the corporate level, but if we were to take it up on an international level, is it an issue of trade? And do we need more of an all of government approach rather than just the financial institutions and financial regulators stepping in? So thank you very much, Leah Rahman. Yep. advisor to the Institutional Investors Council of Malaysia and Pang Oi Cheng from KPMG. You have been so courageous in diving into this and giving us your views. And I certainly hope for you, the audience, it has churned some thoughts in your minds on where we are going and where you should be going. And if anything, I do hope, my personal hope is that it will this conversation would have moved the needle for you in ensuring that when it comes to ESG, you are surer now than ever before that it is good business to invest in good businesses. So with that, I hand over the time back to Naveen. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our moderator, uh, Ms. Karen Lam and our panelists, Ms. Lea Rahman and Ms. Pang Oi Cheng for that extremely insightful presentation.